Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. So I just wanted to kick off today by addressing what I think is or, or should be an elephant in the room, which is that I want to be crystal clear that we should not want to live in a country where the party in power is able to use police force to arrest its political opposition. And I do not want to see that day come to pass in this country. It is not the subject of my speech here today, but it's too important of a topic not to mention. I'll be outside this room talking to anybody afterwards who wants to be talking about it because I think we need more people in our movement to actually step up with courage in a moment of need. But what I'm going to talk about today is actually something even deeper than that. Like even, what we, even what we see today is really just a symptom of a cultural cancer in our country. Okay, what I'm going to tell you about is the rise of three secular cults in America. I won't even call them religions. Religions have withstood the test of time. I'm going to call them cults. They all arose at the same time. It's a bit of a mystery. And then I'm going to tell you what's really going on. Okay, the first of those cults is a cult that says your identity is based on your race, full stop. That your skin color determines what you can achieve in this country and even what you're allowed to think. That if you're black, you're inherently disadvantaged. That if you're white, you're inherently privileged. No matter your economic background or your upbringing, that your race governs who you are and what you can achieve in life. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley of the Squad summed it up pretty well when she said that we don't want any more black faces that don't want to be a black voice, that we don't want any more brown faces that don't want to be a brown voice. I don't think the last few brown voices you heard from fit her description of what counts as a brown voice. But there's something really deeper, cancerous in this ideology, and it's this. When your race goes from being about your skin color to being about the content of the ideas you're allowed to espouse, then any disagreement with those ideas automatically makes you a racist. And there is no greater damnation in modern America than to be called a racist. So when given the choice, between pledging allegiance to this new religion and being tarred with the scarlet R, everyday Americans are choosing to bend the knee. And that's what's created this new culture of fear in our country. Fear of losing your jobs, fear of your kids getting a bad grade in school, fear of becoming a pariah in your own community. And that culture of fear is really what's eroded our culture of free speech in America. And if you ask me, the best measure of the health of any democracy, especially American democracy, is the percentage of people who feel free to say what they actually think in public. See, that's the, that's the first of these cults I was going to tell you about. But there's a little bit of a coincidence in America because there's a second cult that arose right at the same time. That is the cult of gender ideology in America. And this cult has two key commandments that it espouses, okay? The first commandment is that the sex of the person you're attracted to is hardwired on the day you're born because it had to be in order to be a civil right. But at the exact same time, it also asks you to believe that your own biological sex is completely fluid over the course of your lifetime. These two things can't make sense at the same time if you're operating according to principles of logic but if you're operating according to a quasi-religious cult, then you can espouse those contradictory beliefs at the same time. That's what it is. And then it makes a really similar move, actually. So Peter Thiel, who's a Republican backer who spoke at the, at the GOP convention, actually, back in 2016, he's a man who's attracted to men. But the advocate, the leading magazine in this country, the leading LGBTQIA plus advocacy magazine, said Peter Thiel is not gay because he does not represent the gay voice. Same move as Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. So now I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you about how this mystery wraps up when I tell you about the third cult that's arisen right at the same time. That is the new climate cult 
in this country, which says that we face an existential risk as human beings unless we combat carbon emissions. And yet here's the contradiction in this cult, which is that the same cult that worries about the emission of carbon in the United States does not say a peep about actual carbon emissions in places like China, even as PetroChina buys up the very projects that we force Chevron to drop on the other side of the world, emitting even more carbon in the process. So that should be a little bit of a mystery. And then the other mystery about this particular cult is that it is also weirdly hostile to nuclear energy, which is actually the best known form of carbon-free energy production known to mankind. And so you would think that if you were opposed to carbon emissions, you would be embracing nuclear energy, but they're not because nuclear energy might be too good at solving the alleged climate problem. And that climate religion has about as much to do with the climate as the Spanish Inquisition had to do with Christ, which is to say nothing at all. It is about power, dominion, control, and punishment. So it's not a coincidence that we see the rise of these cults, these secular religions at the same time. The real question is, what the heck is going on in America right now that causes these new faiths to occupy us with a cult-like following? The answer is this. We're in the middle of a national identity crisis in this country. Okay, the things that used to give us a sense of purpose and meaning and identity, things like faith, patriotism, hard work, these things have disappeared. They're gone in most of American life. That leaves a moral vacuum in its wake. My generation, we're so hungry for a cause, hungry to be part of something bigger than ourselves, yet we can't even answer the question of what it means to be an American today. You wonder why we have this epidemic of depression and anxiety and this mental health epidemic in America, it's because we're starving for purpose and yet we're left with instead wokeism, transgenderism, climatism, COVIDism, the equivalent of fast food to satisfy a moral hunger, going to Ben and Jerry's, ordering a cup of ice cream with some social justice sprinkles on top, thinking that's gonna satisfy our hunger. You cannot satisfy a moral hunger with fast food. You need something real, something true to take its place. And this is an opportunity for our movement. This is an opportunity for conservatives across America to rise to that occasion. Not just to do even what I've been doing, frankly, over the last few years, pointing out the problem, going on cable news, selling books. Great, it's a good message to sell books. I promise you that, we've sold a lot of books. That's fine, I think there's a role for pointing out the problem too. And now the rest of the Republican establishment and field now understands the word woke, and, or at least they recite it. But I think that that's, that's fine, we can point out the problem. But now we need to go upstream and address the actual solution. This is an opportunity for the conservative movement in America to answer that question of what it actually means to be an American today. What does it mean to be American? It means you believe in basic concepts like merit. The idea that you get ahead in America not on the color of your skin, as Martin Luther King said it, but on the content of your character and your contributions, which is why we need to declare an end to affirmative action in this country. It has been a cancer on our national soul and we need to be done with it. It means you embrace merit in who gets into this country. You embrace the rule of law who gets into this country. I say this as the kid of immigrants. My parents came here 40 years ago through the front door, paid their taxes, they followed the rules. They raised two kids, both of whom went on to found companies that helped thousands of Americans. They taught us that entering a marriage, that starting a family entails a sacrifice, but that some things are worth sacrificing for, that hardship is not the same thing as victimhood. We should embrace more immigrants like them, but that also means unapologetically saying no to anyone whose first act of entering this country 
is a law-breaking one. And that's not a racist thing to say. That's not a xenophobic thing to say. It is an American thing to say that we believe in the rule of law in this country. What does it mean to be American? It means you believe in free speech and open debate as the way we settle our questions rather than using force to do it. I don't even call it big tech censorship in our country anymore. I call it what it really is. I call it government tech censorship, where the government is using companies to do through the back door what the government could it's not itself do through the front door under the Constitution. It means we need to wake up from our 1980 dogmas as a conservative movement to recognize that the real threat to power today, is to, to liberty today, is not just big government, but it is a hybrid of big government and big business that together do what neither can do on its own. To say if the government is getting a private company to do its dirty work, to say that if it is state action in disguise, then the Constitution still applies, that these companies ought to be bound by the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States when they are working hand in glove with the government to do its illegal work. That is what it means to be a conservative and an American today. It means we believe that the people who we elect to run the government are the ones who actually run the government, not an administrative cancerous bureaucracy that actually runs the show today. I'll tell you, I've had success in business. I've built multi-billion dollar businesses from scratch. I'll teach you a constitutional lesson from that experience, and it's this. If somebody works for you and you can't fire them, that means they don't work for you. It means you work for them because you're going to be responsible for what they do without having any power over it. So here I am, the fool running for the White House, to be a stooge that works for the federal managerial bureaucracy. No, no, no. We're going to change the way those rules work when next time an Anthony Fauci or a Merrick Garland or a James Comey reaches beyond their constitutional scope. You got to do what the chief executive of this country is empowered to do. You fire them. You fire the legions of people under them. You fire the managerial industrial complex around them. That is how we do it. We shut down government agencies from the Department of Education, which should have never existed in the first place. That's what's responsible for wokeism in our schools. That is what is responsible for the national worker shortage. You shut down the Department of Education. You also then go to the agencies that have become such a cancerous rot that the only answer left is to shut them down, and I'm the first candidate to say it, and believe me, I mean it. We will shut down the FBI and create something new to take its place from scratch. This is what it means to live in a self-governing constitutional republic. These are the basic ideas that our founders set into motion 250 years ago, and if we can wake up those basic ideas, then we can take on the actual challenges externally that we face on the global stage. And the top one of them is actually, it's not Ukraine, in my opinion. It is on the other side of the Pacific. It is to declare independence from communist China. That is the declaration of independence of our century. It is what Thomas Jefferson would have signed if he were alive today. It is what I will sign if I'm elected as the next U.S. president. Because you know what? Unlike the Soviet Union in the last century, we depend on our number one enemy today for the shoes on our feet and the phones in our pocket. How we got here is a complicated story we should all be ashamed of and learn from, but we are where we are. We're in a codependent relationship with China. Codependent relationships do not end well. The only question is who ends it first. The sooner we end it, the better for us. The longer we wait, the better for them. We need the courage to think on the time scales of history, not on the time scales of just our short-term election cycles. All right, the easy stuff is easy. You, ab you abandon the climate cult that shackles the United States while leaving China untouched. You use the U.S. military to actually secure our own border from the Chinese opium war of the fentanyl epidemic that floods our country. 
You use it to actually take out and annihilate the cartels south of Mexico rather than fighting people halfway around the Atlantic on the other side of the world. You use it to fight digital fentanyl in the form of TikTok that's polluting the minds of our next generation. If you can't smoke a cigarette by the age of 18, you shouldn't be using an addictive digital fentanyl since the age of 14 or 15 either. This is the easy stuff. A financial fentanyl, for that matter, and the national debt that China sells us, that's an addiction too. We're addicted to our enemy, but we're gonna have to go further. All right, when I tell you that we're declaring independence from China, I'm not just gonna give you the rosy stuff. I'm going to tell you how it's really going to work. It's not going to be totally easy. We have to be willing to make that sacrifice to tell these companies that you are not going to do business in China until the CCP either reforms its behaviors or until the CCP falls. That will take some sacrifice. But here's the secret in geopolitics. It's when you're most willing to make a sacrifice that you will not have to make one at all. We need a little more Churchill, a little less Chamberlain in our foreign policy. And you know what? I predict the CCP will fall by 2030 if we're able to actually muster up the fortitude to do what we need to do at home because it's like my parents taught me. You can make that sacrifice if you know what you're sacrificing for, and that is this thing we call America. We have spent the last decade celebrating our diversity and our differences so much that we forgot all the ways we're really just the same as Americans bound by a common creed, a common set of ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago, I'm looking around this room and I'm happy that we see different shades of melanin, different genders, two of them. It's good. It's diversity. We like diversity. Our diversity can be a beautiful thing, but it is completely meaningless too if there's nothing greater that binds us together. Without that, we're just a Bunch of different looking higher mammals with two legs roaming a common geographic space through the aimless passage of time doing what our iPhones told us to do on a given day. Sometimes I wake up and that's what America looks like to me. But that isn't the real America we know, right? America is a vision of what a place can be, a vision that brought a divided, headstrong group of people together 250 years ago with a common set of ideals. And I believe deep in my bones, and I think most of you do too, that those ideals still exist in this country, that they are alive and well, that they still unite us at what in the same way it says at the bottom of every one of our coins, e pluribus unum, from many, one. You see, that is the dream that won the American Revolution 250 years ago. That is the dream that reunited us after the Civil War 160 years ago. That is the dream that won us World War I and World War II and the Cold War. That is the dream that still gives hope to the free world. And if we can revive that dream over fractious group identity, then nobody in the world, not a nation, not a corporation, not a virus is gonna defeat us. That is what American exceptionalism is all about. And that is what we need to revive in order to save this great nation. Thank you. God bless you. God bless your families. And God bless our United States of America. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll stay here for some questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I love South Carolina, man. We've had a great day here already. Hey, it's, a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, it's a great state to live, work, raise a family. Hey, I, we're going to do a little bit of Q&A. Let's do it. Uh, we, we got a few minutes, and we're going to open that up. If you would like to a ask a question, one of these two gentlemen with the mics have a, have a mic. If you have a question, just simply slip up your hand, and they will come to you. But as a point of presidential privilege, I'm going to ask you the first question. Let's do it. We're both fairly young. 
Um, how have you, fairly? Fairly, yeah. Uh, can I, I never supposed to ask uh, a lady, how, how old are you? I'm 37. 37. I was born in 1985. Got two kids, actually. They, they're in nap time right now, or else I would have brought them. They're here with me in South Carolina, actually. Very similar. Let me ask you this. How, how many times have you been told, you just need to hold on a little bit, wait a little bit longer, you're a little too young, Wait until later, and what's your response to that? My whole life is the answer to that question. Right. Not always about age, but there's, there's all the people in the world who tell you you can't do something. And you know what you, know what you actually owe them? I used to, as a, as a teenager, as a younger person in my 20s, that used to annoy me. But actually, you gotta, now you've got to just thank them, actually, because many of them mean well for you. And in order to change reality, you have to know what reality is today, right? When I started a biotech company as a guy who came from outside of biotech, we developed medicines. The one I'm most proud of is a drug for prostate cancer, actually. It's FDA approved today. People said, you're not gonna be able to do this as an outsider coming in. You know what, pharma's run like a managerial bureaucracy in a government. I came in to break that system. We made a lot of progress doing it. When I started to write Woke Inc., actually the first book agent, I sent my, uh, my first draft chapter to said that, you know what, you need to start writing on Medium instead, and if you've made some wealth, you might want to sponsor other authors who actually have real talent in writing rather than, you know, a rich guy who thinks he can, uh, and, you know, was born rich but had by the time built businesses. Those things motivate me, actually, and, and you know what, it's something, I, I get in politics now, too. You got to wait your turn. Well, if I was actually going to build a career as a politician, they're probably right, right? You don't jump straight into the presidency, but if you're running or you're doing whatever you're doing, forget if it's running for office, if you're doing it for a true purpose, then you don't let anything in the way stop you. I was telling a story earlier today to a small group. Was my favorite story about Christ actually comes not from the Bible, but comes from one of my all-time great favorites, Fyodor Dostoevsky. He wrote the story of the, the Grand Inquisitor. It's a parable in his book, The Brothers Karamazov, The Brothers K. It tells the story of how Christ comes back to earth in the middle of the Spanish Inquisition, he's spotted on the street performing miracles. The Grand Inquisitor comes in and has him arrested. And the climax of the chapter is the dialogue between Christ and the Grand Inquisitor in the prison cell. And the Grand Inquisitor tells Christ, we the church don't need you here anymore. Your presence here actually impedes our work and he sentences Christ to execution the next day. I feel like I see that story every day in American life today where the folks who are supposed to safeguard a set of values become the obstacle to actually realizing those values. And whether that's the Democratic Party, whether that's the Republican Party at times, if you're on the path to achieving the true purpose, then you got to have people who are willing to run straight through it. And that's kind of how I feel entering this race. Wow. Okay. That was an excellent answer. Thank you. Let's jump. Uh, Sebastian? Yes, sir. How are you doing? I uh, have a question for you. So, the past few years with COVID, two is one thing. How quickly these agencies can come in and strip us of our rights. And it starts to move very quickly. What are you going to do to keep that? Make sure that doesn't happen in the future. Because I can do. So the thing I want to say, great question. I can do half of that as president, but I can't do all of it. Okay, the first half of it is you need a U.S. president who believes in not asking for either permission or forgiveness when it comes to shutting down the administrative state. Okay, so I believe Article 2 of the Constitution says that if you run the executive branch of the government, then by God, you run the executive branch of the government. And anytime somebody overreaches that, you have to be actually act on your own constitutional conviction to shut them down and despite civil service protections where they'll tell you you can't fire them, actually believe those are unconstitutional and you gotta act on it. But that's only half of it. Okay, that's the easy part. That's the easy part for most people. The hard part is this. You gotta look yourself in the mirror. We have to look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves what is it inside that causes us to want to bend the knee? That's the question, it only works if we bend the knee to authority. It's like the Israelites lost in the desert. What did they say? When they're lost in the desert, they can't see the promised land. They want to go back and be ruled by Pharaoh. Okay, there's something about being lost in the desert that makes you want to bend the knee to authority. Okay, and that's something that doesn't come from up top down. It comes from within each of us. And so my job as president will be, yes, to shut down the administrative state and to set the best example I can to point out that black hole 
But we're not going to do it through just a revival of government alone. It's going to take a bottom-up revival of culture, of faith, of family, of God, to fill that sense of purpose and conviction that stops us, people our age and younger, really of any age in this country today, to want to bend the knee to authority. I think we also have to look within every time we point to the government, too. Both of those are important. Excellent question. Thank you. Good question. Excellent question. We've got time for one more. Right we go all day. I like well, this. You can go all day. I'll hang out outside. We're going to do a little, uh, a little announcement afterwards. Thank you. Oh, so I, yeah, thank you for that. I think that I, what I like talking to educated audiences is this is actually the real political battle of our time. It's not even between Republicans and Democrats. It is between the Great Reset, which means dissolving boundaries between nations, dissolving boundaries between the public and private sector so that they can work together to achieve the common good. It is between the Great Reset and what I call the Great Uprising of citizens of self-governing nations, including and especially the United States, who say absolutely not to that agenda, that I'm not a citizen of the globe, I am a citizen of this nation. And so what is a US president gonna do? You have to be able to take on some of these sacred cows that even the Republican Party is unwilling to touch. All right, ending affirmative action. Not a single, here's a fun fact, not a single US presidential candidate in history has pledged to end affirmative action, even though it's actually unpopular amongst most Americans. The Great Reset's vision is this racial quota system. Not a single one is actually willing to take on the demands of the climate cult. They may talk about time horizons or whatever without actually recognizing that the agenda itself is based on falsehood. So what do you do about it? And I'll close with this. I think you lead with courage the courage of your own convictions. Because if we learn one thing about America in the last half decade, it is that fear is infectious. The managerial class preys on that fear. Their trick only works if fear continues to spread. But here's my little secret for you too, okay? I think courage can be contagious too. It just takes more people who are willing to demonstrate it. And you know what, we are in the habit of waiting for and expecting in our politics that someone's going to come from on high and save us. I have some news for you, okay? When it comes to politics, nobody's coming from on high to save us. If we're going to be saved, it's going to be because we save ourselves, that we educate ourselves, and we empower ourselves, and that is what we're leading as a cultural movement across this country. Thank you for having me. Great time with you all today. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks for the warm welcome. Appreciate it, man. Really enjoyed that. Great yeah. job. Thank you for I having me. Right yeah, yeah. We'll be right outside. Thank you.